Vampires have existed in mythology for hundreds upon hundreds of years. Even to this day, they have cemented themselves in modern culture. From horror to romance, they have cemented themselves into the cultural mythos. However, what we think of as a vampire is a fairly modern development in the long life of this vampire. It wasn't until like the late 17th century to early 18th century that the traits that we consider part of the vampire trope began to appear, which leads me on to today's poem, The Vampire by John Stagg. This poem is interesting as it uses a lot of modern vampiric tropes, yet it's fairly early on of the development of the modern vampire. Published in 1810 in John Stagg's anthology Minstrel of the North, it predates a lot of famous vampire works such as John William Polidori's short story also called The Vampire, which is said to be the forebearer of most of the romantic vampire stories. So as this poem predates that, is this actually the modern forebearer to the romantic stories that we think of of vampires now? Well, not exactly, but it is a really interesting pinpoint in the development of such. The poem itself is quite long, so I won't read it in its entirety. I'll just read quotes and snippets that are relevant to what I'm talking about or the analysis. So the poem centres around Gertrude and her husband Herman and his recently deceased friend Sigismund. It starts as a back and forth between Gertrude and Herman. Gertrude is worried about her ill husband and Herman is the victim of the vampire who we later find out is Sigismund who was his recently deceased friend. Herman during this back and forth tells Gertrude how to kill him after he dies so that he doesn't come back as a vampire like Sigismund. After Herman dies Gertrude finds Sigismund over Herman's body and as such tells the townspeople and they go to Sigismund's tomb and kill him and lock him and Herman in the same tomb where they're never heard from again. Therefore, most likely dead. For real. So just from that brief explanation of the poem alone, you can already see like several important vampire tropes like being picked up on. Um, the most prominent of which is the drinking of blood, which whilst wasn't an emphasis in the original myth, it was there, but sources differ on whether or not it was as important as the idea that there was like a demon inside somebody or the links to disease and plagues at the time. Despite this, the idea of drinking blood is definitely a more modern trope as it links to scientific breakthroughs at the time. A lot of people drank blood as a way of, as a form of medicine, and it was in such big supplies because bloodletting was also another form of medicine that was really common. So the twisting of this life-saving medicine is what creates this horror in this poem that would later be developed into more romantic, I suppose, connotations. So the horror of this act comes from warping something seemingly life-saving to save the life of something already dead which is just goes against everything natural that we know and especially what they knew at the time of the poem. The first few lines of the poem already alert us to the lack of blood in Herman. Why looks my lord so deadly pale? Why fades the crimson from his cheek? What can my dearest husband ail? Thy heartfelt cares, O oh, Herman, speak. So instantly we are aware of the lack of blood and this is what's making Herman ill. This leads into the medicinal side of vampirism. In modern media. Due to the understanding of diseases at the time, coupled with the fact that there were several incredibly bad outbreaks due to the uh, urbanisations of cities, the emphasis on hollow cheeks and pale skin really relates to a lot of genuine diseases at the time of the poem. And here Stagg clearly is drawing a parallel between the two and this would later be developed in various ways for example, the way in which vampirism was spread changes throughout the development. In this poem, vampirism is both a cause and a symptom. Herman, due to lack of blood, is basically dying and his wife has somehow only just now noticed this and Sigismund also has similar imagery tied to him, therefore linking the disease to the cause of the disease 
and so on and so forth. When we think of vampires, we have a very certain image that comes to mind. Sharp fangs, uh, long nails, pale, gaunt, often looking a little bit um, hollow in several ways. Generally, this is to invoke an uncanny effect where we see something that looks human but not quite human, something that should seemingly be dead but isn't, and this is where the horror comes from. And these aspects are built upon in this poem. I mentioned earlier about the hollow cheeks and pale skin, but at the poem's most pivotal moment, when we finally see the true vampire form, Sigismund is standing over Herman's dead body and Gertrude walks in and is horrified by what she finds. His jaws cadaverous were besmeared with clotted carnage o'er and over, and all his horrid hull appeared, distent and filled with human gore. This image is the most horrific that it gets in the poem. The use of cadaverous here is really a really interesting choice because not only does it make us think of something obviously dead, but it also makes us think of something warped, something rotted, something that should not be moving. And this goes against, like I said earlier, everything natural that we know about how the world works. You know, you die and you stay dead. We might, you know, you might believe that our spirit goes on, but generally speaking, everyone believes that the body stays dead. So here we see the complete opposite happening and for a lot of people that would be shocking, especially at the time. But the focus on the mouth here shows the very key imagery that the vampire has, which is the mouth. It's how he drinks his vital blood as it's put in the poem and how they spread this disease as well as enact violence. Traditionally, vampires affected common people. They were found in villages and often wiped out a whole population. Many sources believe it's linked to the idea of plagues and not understanding disease at all. And so it was easier to blame the first person that died and call them a vampire than it was to admit there was this otherworldly force to them that was destroying their population. But one shift we see in the modern development of the vampire is this shift from common to aristocratic. Now when we picture a modern vampire, we often think of something very from high society. For example, if you think of the Hammer horror films with Christopher Lee, he is often wearing a cape, he has his hair slicked back, it is a very almost vain look. Another example would be Dracula probably one of the most famous vampire stories out there, who lives and owns a castle, which is as high in society as you probably could get. And in this poem, this is hinted that these vampires slash victims of vampire are very up, like very, are the very high class or at least not the lowest of the low classes. For example, Gertrude refers to Herman as my lord, and this could be um, Gertrude literally calling him my lord or it could be like some sort of pet name but realistically nobody at the time would have called their husband my lord unless they were a lord and furthermore Sigismund, when they find him he's in a tomb not a grave a tomb which just screams wealth and also the name Sigismund is heavily tied to a lot of monarchs i believe in germany so already that name has connotations of aristocracy and higher class to the point of kings and queens. So what's the significance of the shift from common to aristocratic? Well it kind of boils down to the shift in art movements at the time, the turn into the 19th century. So very vaguely neoclassism focused on general ideas, grand ideas, um, universal truths that everybody should know, whereas romanticism focused more on the individual imagination and as such became more individualistic in the way things were written at the time. And this can be seen in the way the vampires developed because aristocracy is such a small percentage of society that it would only be able to come from somebody who had a small circle. Furthermore, a very common trope that we find in modern vampire stories is this idea that they go after one specific victim or a small group of victims. So we see this in Dracula, we see this in lots of other, um, in lots of other vampire stories. 
And this is no exception for this poem, because Sigismund seemingly only feeds on Hermann. And this could simply be because he was the first person he came across, I guess, because it is hinted that he was there when he turned. Um, But he could have easily also fed off Gertrude or any other numerous amount of people that were in this town that they're in. But he chooses Hermann specifically, pointing to a more individualistic approach to vampires. One could even argue that this was a... um, critical viewpoint of the politics at the time. The early 1800s was a very tumultuous time, especially in the UK. For example, it would only be nine years later that the Peterloo Massacre would occur, an event in which 60,000 people gathered to protest for the right to vote. And because the government was so afraid of this getting passed, they sent the cavalry in and killed 18 people and injured hundreds of others. And it is known as one of the fiery moments that really boosts the Chartist movements in the UK. And not to mention the French Revolution, which took place across different periods, but it started in 1789. And the subsequent reign of Napoleon rocked all of what Europe knew about power and where it was held. Napoleon, as a figure, was born of upper class, but was nowhere near the levels of which people had ruled before. A lot of other governments were really scared that the working classes would rise up and put somebody non-aristocratic in leadership. So long story short, the aristocracy felt very threatened during the 19th century by working class people. So leading into the poem, you could argue that the development of the vampire is a response to this, but not by the aristocracy. Sigismund and Hermann, both being aristocrats, are the only ones that we see in the poem affected by vampirism. Yet they are destroyed and killed for definite by an undefined class of people. The poem merely refers to these people as the council and as a choir, so the class of these people is not known. However, it's not a far stretch to say that they would probably be in a lower class than these two aristocrats. And here it's worth pointing out that John Stagg himself did not come from much money. His dad owned a tailor shop and a small bit of land, but when Stagg was young and he was in still being educated, he had an accident and lost his sight and subsequently never finished his education. So spent a lot of his years working different jobs, even at one point, um, playing his fiddle for local festivals in order to make money and later he would move to Manchester which was at the heart of a lot of uh, political reform groups so he would have been way more exposed to political movements than a lot of writers would have been otherwise and so it was not a far stretch to see that he may have thought of things through this more critical lens. However all, all of this is to say that this is just like an interpretation of this poem and that whilst you could definitely read this poem for a Marxist lens, it's far more likely that it's more to do with the artistic movements of the time. However, this doesn't make it any less fun to talk about. You know, the word Marxist hadn't even been coined when this poem was written, yet it's so interesting that we can still see things through this very Marxist lens and that, like, is to me part of the reason why I think this poem's really interesting, especially in this development of the modern vampire in regards to uh, different critical viewpoints at the time. So what was the point in looking at this poem in the first place? Well, it's an interesting exercise for anybody who is interested in literature and wants to look at the how certain tropes were formed, because that is, to me, some of the most interesting parts of literature. Not necessarily genre, but, you know, how certain stories have become so widely known and certain monsters such as vampires or Frankenstein or the werewolf have cemented themselves into pop culture and why they persist more than any others. For me, vampires are so interesting because they've sustained themselves in modern culture since this period and haven't really ever dipped or left. 
there's been waves and there has been different versions of vampires but generally speaking if you look at any decade since then there has been something along the lines of vampire or blood-sucking fiend sort of um made and this didn't stop with literature it translated into film and then into television and why that persists is so interesting to me like why they persist is like a mix of different things i like to think it's about abject horror and the um twisting of all we see as natural which i think is just something that really persists within horror in general but you could also say that it's because there's like a fear of what happens after death and they show us some a life beyond that and how maybe being immortal isn't great so they could really act as a cautionary tale also there's many different reasons why this persists and there's many different arguments as to why they do but the fact that there are so many different reasons as to why you could argue that vampires have existed within pop culture for so long just proves the point that something that is human but not quite human like a vampire or a werewolf um or like a zombie for example like really touches a certain nerve within us that ultimately horrifies scares it might intrigue us um when it comes to romance that might be why because it's so different than anything we'd ever know um and i think that's why vampires are so interesting and this poem just points to that turn into something familiar and i think that's the most interesting things you can find in literature